I'm a big animal lover, and I've had pets all my life. I think that any pet owner would agree with me when I say that a pet is a valued member of the family. How do pets cope with major changes and disruptions in a family, like separation, illness, and even death? In the case of a family breakdown, how do you get pets accustomed to constantly changing parenting schedules and routines? Today our topic is, Pets are Family Too. Brought to you by AdviceScene.com. Free legal answers from verified lawyers. In cases of shared custody, can pets get used to living in more than one home? How do you ensure a harmonious household if new pets are introduced into the home? This is what we'll be discussing with today's guests. Let's meet them. And they're both named Rebecca. First, we have Dr. Rebecca Ledger, who's a clinical animal behaviorist. And also joining us is an animal law lawyer, Rebecca Bretter. Thank you both, Rebecca, for being here today. Thank you. Dr. Ledger, do you mind if I call you Doc? Not at all. Okay, that would be great. <laughs> we first have to introduce our audience to a friend that you brought with us, with you today. That's right. This is Pippa, and she's a 12-year-old English Springer Spaniel. And, uh, she's Was my she dog. a maid of honor at any point? <laughs> um, no, I got her after uh, I got married, but um, she's, uh, she's like my little girl. She's well, we have our pet. own Pippa mm -hmm. right here in the studio, and she's most welcome. Thank you for bringing her. Thank you. I want to ask you, uh, what does a clinical animal behaviorist do? It's uh, a little like uh, psychiatry for animals. So what I do is uh, I, uh, if a, an owner has a pet with a behavioral problem and they'll speak to their vet about it, then the vet will refer that case to me. And then I do a house call and I diagnose the problem and then set the animal on a treatment plan and hopefully it gets better. <laughs> what kinds of behavior problems do animals have? I see both cats and dogs. Um, with dogs, the most common problem is aggression. Aggressive behavior. Absolutely. Um, often directed at people or at other animals. And uh, um, with cats, they're similarly, aggression is a big problem as a toileting problems, cats spraying around the house or um, not using their litter tray properly. Uh, those are big problems in cats that I see. Can mm -hmm. I just ask you, how do you teach a cat how to use the litter box? Well, it's, uh, it's important to understand why the cat's not using the litter box in the first place. And in many cases, there's an underlying physical problem that needs to be addressed. Ah, so there's a physical problem too. Very often, but those physical problems often start behavioral problems in, uh, in motion. And so then even when the physical problem is dealt with, the behavioral problem is still there. So uh, we have to retrain the cat um, to use its litter tray properly and understand what, uh, how to make a litter box very, very attractive. Um, That's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca, you're an animal law lawyer. Yes, what sir. kinds of cases do you deal with in your practice? Well, animal law is, it's an interdisciplinary practice. It's, uh, it's quite a general practice and, and really if there's an animal involved, uh, whether it's wildlife or a companion animal, it's animal law. It, it deals with traditional areas of practice like property law, uh, tort law or negligence law, criminal, really and wills and estates and today's actually a perfect example because we're dealing with family legal issues and with pets involved so that, that is certainly an animal law issue. Well I know some people will be upset to hear this uh, but I guess we have to put this on the table. In law my understanding is that pets, animals, are property. Yes, unfortunately uh, they are, unfortunately for, for many I should say, uh, they are considered personal property under the law. But really courts are recognizing increasingly so that animals and companion animals in particular are something more than just property. I mean it's... You but you can't get custody of a cat or a dog in the same way you could of a child, could you? Oh, well, yes and no. There aren't any uh, special rules governing animals, um, no. except for, of course, uh, cruelty laws. Of course, yes. But th there certainly are ways you could get custody, and, and usually uh, what I advise clients is to avoid the court system if you can and work it out through, uh, through outside uh, legal ways, like mediations, agreements. 
But I have seen cases, and I'm sure, Doc, you're not going to be surprised by this, where an attachment to an animal is just as intense, and, every, and the hostility around the battle over a pet is just as intense as if it were a child. Oh, absolutely. People, um, they treat their pets like family members in many cases. And, uh, and the bond, the bond, the animal-human bond is very powerful yeah. and, uh, and, and it's painful when it's severed. Absolutely. Um, and couples often fight quite uh, fiercely over who is going to have custody of the pets. I would say sometimes even, even more so with, with their dogs and cats than, than over children, especially if they don't have children of their own. Well, Rebecca, in your practice, dealing with, uh, I think Pippa's very disappointed to hear that, <laughs> that people are fighting over dogs so intensely. Um, in your practice, in, in specifically dealing with divorce, separation divorce cases, what kinds of issues have you arisen, besides the obvious that each one wants the animal? Ownership is probably the biggest issue. How do you show who really owns the dog or the cat? It's usually about a dog. Um, because again, animals are property, right? So, but what if they both went to the shelter and adopted a, a, a homeless animal? Uh, how do you prove ownership? Yeah, exa that's a very good question. It's really about who has more evidence about what they did for the dog, how they cared for it, uh, whose name is the dog registered under? Who paid for the vet bills? Who paid for the vet who buys bills? Buys the food? Uh, yeah, all yeah, of that. Exactly. Yeah. At some point, do you ever feel like saying to people, "Look"? you get another pet you, you'll fall in the, the money you're spending on the litigation uh, for what you're spending you could just get another pet am I crazy to say that I mean yes I would say you are I think many people would say you're crazy but uh, at the same time and many I, that's that's <laughs> no I, I mean I just can't see I, I mean I'm a huge pet lover I live with a veterinarian everyone knows that but I must say that um, to spend a whole lot of money on an animal um, that is going to get good care no matter which home they're in mm -hmm. because they both love the animal that much um, seems to me to be unfortunate when they could go to a, a shelter give another animal a home that needs a home mm -hmm. am I out to lunch here well I would say personally you're out to lunch but I think many right. judges across the country would agree with you although thankfully I think to many uh, dog owners, uh, th they'll be happy to hear that the law is slowly changing, mainly because, like I said, to many people, dogs are a huge component of, of their family structure. And no so doubt. if you're willing to spend the money on fighting custody battles over human children, there are many people out there that who, will do it for animals. who would do it for animals. All right. And it's on really a note. question. All right. On that note, we're going to go to a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about stress. I'm feeling some now. Stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back to our discussion about the four-legged members of the family with our animal behaviorist and our animal lawyer. Do animals react to stress, doctor? Oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, dogs, cats, humans, we all react to stress in very similar ways, physically, behaviorally, and emotionally. Can they pick up on human stress? Uh, definitely, it's particularly when, uh, when couples aren't getting along, if there's more fighting and shouting and arguing in the household, uh, that kind of disruption can have quite profound effects on the animals. Can a pet grieve yes. uh, if, 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 if a member of the family leaves the home? Yes, they, they absolutely can. They, How can you tell if your pet is, is grieving? Well, uh, some of the first studies on uh, depression were actually done on dogs. So we know that they experience depression much like humans do. Um, and typically they would show a lack of appetite. They would seem more listless, m less responsive. They, didn't, they wouldn't seem to enjoy going for walks and all the fun stuff that they used to do as much. And what about cats? Cats are the same and they'll also often start spraying around the house, not using their litter trays, but they'll be even more withdrawn off their food. I'll say, um, so you might say I'm crazy again, but I've just got to say, if I had to have a depressed animal, it sounds like I'd rather have the dog <laughs> than the cat. Not too keen on the spraying around the house thing. Doesn't that really smell? Uh, it does, absolutely. Yes. Right, so not so usually great. very quick to want to deal with it. And I'm yeah. a big cat person, but uh, thank God I'm not separated because I don't want the spraying. Yeah. And if it happens, I'll be the one leaving the home. Oh, you call me. <laughs> uh, I'll call you. That's exactly right. <laughs> 
What about when a, another pet is gone? Yeah, so you know, we see cases where a couple separate, they've got two pets, one takes each. Does anyone care that the two pets might have been quite bonded? Oh, they get depressed uh, when uh, they're separated from an owner or a pet. And, and if they're attached and bonded and that bond is broken, they, they really do grieve, yeah. So how do you treat that? Mm. Sometimes uh, it's suggested that the owner gets another pet. Um, sometimes that can help. You see, getting mm. another pet wasn't such a bad <laughs> idea. I'm not that crazy after all. Does it help or does the animal, I mean, uh, is it a guarantee that an animal is going to bond with a new animal? No, not necessarily. Compatibility is very, very important. And, and don't get pets get jealous? Uh, they can do, absolutely. But like if, if the new animal in the home is getting all the attention, wouldn't you think that the pet's going to be a little jealous? I, it probably depends on, on the individual animal, I would say. Yeah, but it, it happens. Certainly if hierarchies are upset and, uh, um, you know, one dog perhaps isn't getting as much attention from its owner as it was, that can be upsetting. So it's important that the owners know how to manage a new animal coming into the house so everybody feels happy about it. Yeah. I wanted to mention to Rebecca, our lawyer here, I actually had a case, uh, and I remember it very vividly, it was a child protection case and the adolescent uh, girl had been placed in foster care because of severe neglect at home. And when I asked her what kind of visitation she'd like with her parents, she said, I really don't care if I don't see them, but I'm really missing my dog. Yeah. And uh, her lawyer asked for an access order so that she could visit the dog. Yeah, that's interesting. And very often, uh, courts, if it does end up before a judge, judges often award custody of the companion animal with wh whoever gets the kids. So the companion animal goes with the kids. That's what often ends up happening. I was lucky in that case. I say I was lucky because I had a solution uh, after speaking to the foster parents. They, they took the dog. Hmm. They were prepared to have the dog come into the home. Uh, and I wondered about how an animal would then adjust to a whole new set of caregivers but still have mm -hmm. the child there. Mm -hmm. now one of the biggest problems is if the, the dog has gone from receiving a lot of attention and company throughout the day to then suddenly being on its own for long times, long periods during the day. And then they can get something called separation anxiety. Separation anxiety? Yeah, it's an anxiety disorder. And the well, how do you treat that? Um, we um, often have to put the animals on medication, um, just like you would treat an anxiety disorder in people. Is it the same kind of medication that people take? It is exactly but the But we would same. never want someone to just begin treating their animal themselves. Absolutely not. It all has to be done under veterinary supervision. Uh, do yeah. not try this at home. No. <laughs> no, because yeah. this is serious. In fact, mm. many people don't know that chocolate is poisonous. It is, absolutely. A lot I, of I see uh, people giving their, their animals, you know, a lick of their chocolate ice cream. Yeah. They don't realize it's no. poisonous. Well, the dogs get very excited as part of the toxicity reaction, and people think they're excited and they're enjoying the experience, but that, that's just the poison effect. It's poisonous. Yeah. It so is. nobody should ever medicate their animal. Mm -hmm. I hear sometimes people saying that they're going to give their dog a Tylenol or a or an aspirin or something. Any words of advice there? Uh, no. If you think your animal is unwell, go straight to a veterinarian. And even... Um, uh, FDA approved drugs for pets can still cause problems if the dog isn't or the cat isn't able to tolerate them or if they're on other medications that interact with those drugs. So be very, very cautious and, and seek veterinary advice. Mm. If an animal, Rebecca, is, is in distress and in need of special care, uh, do you sometimes see the issue of the legal cost? Of, of, uh, who, legally, who's going to pay for these fees? Because I would imagine that the doctor sitting next to you is not cheap. Me. <laughs> I'll bet, I should say inexpensive, I'm sure you're not I'm cheap. I value for money. <laughs> you know I mean? No, really, what does it cost? I mean, I think people would want to know. I, I, I have never had, I've had animals all my life, but mm -hmm. mercifully, I've never had to resort to someone with your expertise, but what does this cost? Well, uh, While well, my animal is spraying all over the room. <laughs> well, a, a consultation with a, a qualified clinical behaviorist like myself is uh, anything between $300 and $500 for one or two house call visits. But then there's a lot of other costs on top of that. There's often blood work required in order to understand physically what's contributing to the animal's behavioral problem. Medications might be required. Uh, 
Uh, Not to mention the price of the new carpet after the cat sprayed on it and you can't get the smell out. Well, I'm often considered to be good value for money by the time the owners had a $50,000 kitchen destroyed by a dog with separation anxiety. 500 bucks on me is kind of a drop in the ocean. But does it work? I mean, you mean to say that a dog that has been so aggressive that it's chewed up furniture uh, in, in, with a $500 expense, uh, having you come and deal with the dog, the issue's gone? Uh, I usually have to do a couple of house calls at least, so there's a diagnostic and a treatment phase and then follow-ups, And uh, but it, uh, the animal's not cured in one visit. What we do is start the animal on a treatment plan and then over a month or two, depending on the nature of the problem, then uh, we monitor and, uh, and hopefully things improve. But rarely um, is any problem actually completely cured. You know, we ma mm. just like in human psychiatry, we manage behavioral problems in animals. We don't cure them. You can't cure schizophrenia. It's uh, similar no, with dogs. No, of course. I hate mm. to, I, I have mm. to ask this question, although I'm dreading it. Are there times that the animal just has to be put down? Absolutely, yes. Sometimes? Yeah. Not That's often, I hope? Well, um, probably in about 5% of cases where the dog is usually very, very aggressive. It's in the best interest of the dog and the, the family and the community. Dog welfare happen. suffer when they're, uh, when okay. they're aggressive. It's time mm. for another break. Time moves mm. quickly on this show. We will be right back and then we will be talking about blended families, shared custody arrangements. See you after the break. We are talking about our beloved pets with our experts today and I want to ask you some quick questions. We don't have a lot of time left but I got to ask you, uh, Rebecca, uh, it's not okay to just have any kind of animal, is it? There are laws about non-domestic animals. Yeah, there certainly, there certainly are and in British Columbia in particular you're not allowed to have exotic animals anymore. And that's so true for most jurisdictions in North America. No exotic animals. What about the maximum number of animals you can have? You know, every once in a while you'll read in the news that some person had 300 cats in their home. Yeah, most, uh, most cities have bylaws restricting the number of cats and dogs that people can have, but then it, it's a matter of how you can enforce it and whether people actually license their animals. That's really the only way that cities can know how many dogs and cats each household has. But there are maximums. There which are we maximums. We shouldn't get carried away. Even well, if we it depends love them. what carrying away means. Mm -hmm. And to every individual, you know, to, to some, having four cats and a couple of dogs could, That's okay. could be fine. No, I'm and talking about people that have hundreds. Yeah. What about animals that get seized by animal control? I understand that you've been involved in, in court cases, both of you. Mm -hmm. uh, how have you helped these families get their pets back? Um, I've helped to diagnose what's actually caused the dog to have the problem in the first place. And, and I take it the animal was seized because it was aggressive? Usually because they're aggressive and then we set them on a treatment plan once we have a diagnosis and if the animal improves then hopefully the judge, judge is usually willing to give uh, the owners a second chance and have their pet back. So Rebecca, are you, uh, are, are, have you had success getting people's pets back? Yes, I can from say. From the pound? Yes, definitely so and, and I should say that uh, they have never actually been aggressive. They fit under the aggressive or dangerous dog definition oh. in the city bylaws. But uh, thanks to Rebecca, Dr. Ledger, with her diagnoses and, and her work with, with the animals, uh, we could, um, I could easily say that in all the cases that we've had, the dogs were not actually aggressive. They usually have a reactivity problem, but not aggressive. So and you are angels of mercy rescuing animals that have been seized. I can see kind of a Disney movie coming out of that. <laughs> I really can. Oh. Tell me now, I must get to the, the, the question of blended families. We are seeing a lot of cases where people uh, enter into new relationships really quickly after they break up and they're in a new relationship with somebody who's already got a pet. Mm -hmm. Do you see problems with pets maybe not getting along with each other? Oh, it happens Kind of so like the ex-spouses? Two dogs together, <laughs> two cats together, a what cat do you and do? a dog. Oh, well, we have to work on um, developing their relationship, making them... But what if um, they can't? I mean, I, I had a cat that hated mm -hmm. dogs and hated other cats. Well, sometimes it is, uh, yeah, the owners have to choose. It's their new partner or the, the dog. And, and do you help them make that choice or do they go to the lawyer <laughs> for that? It's usually pretty obvious. Um, usually someone gets that it's pretty obvious who's going to get their own way. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Oh, so it's already 
set. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. people have relationships with someone and then they've got a child from a previous relationship and that child's allergic. Mm -hmm. Can you do much about that? Um, I, I think uh, doctors are very quick to diagnose children as having allergies to their pets. It's not always um, a pet that's causing an allergy. So I would encourage people to really explore really what's going on with their child before they very swiftly get rid of their animals. It's not always the animals. I would take mm -hmm. it, I think I know what you're going to answer, but I, 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 I would take it that if a child is very distressed, saddened, lonely, uh, because of parental conflict, a, a family breakdown, this is immensely painful for kids. Uh, m some people feel that maybe the child should have a pet, that mm -hmm. the, that, that is a, a very therapeutic thing. I mm -hmm. Is it true? It, it is absolutely. There's so many studies that have shown that uh, owning a pet can improve a child's self-esteem. Um, they, they develop a sense of empathy, they do better at school, they're better socially, they're less withdrawn. There are so many wonderful reasons why children should have pets in their lives. I would only add that people should be reminded constantly, especially when they're looking for adopting or, or buying a, a, an animal, that this is for the lifetime of the animal. Not until the kids have grown up and then there's no use for the dog anymore and then just chuck them away into the pound. Do you but that find it's a lifelong commitment. Is that ha does that happen sometimes? Yeah, it does. Yes, it does. It's very distressing. Um, I also want to ask um, Rebecca, uh, what if a person wants to make arrangements in their will for what should happen to their pet when they're gone? You can definitely make arrangements for adding a pet in a will, but the challenge is uh, you have to ensure that the provision is clear and then whether a court in a particular jurisdiction would actually enforce it. So it's possible, but whether it'll be enforceable in court, uh, we're yet to see. If someone wanted their animal put to sleep because they're going to die, but the animal's not sick, um, do animals have rights? Is there, uh, is there an advocacy possibility for somebody to say, no, this animal's not sick, it shouldn't be put down? No, unfortunately, if the person wants the animal to be put down, then that's what would happen. But what can happen as well is that if the, the family has friends who love the dog, normally they could take them. All right, well, I want to thank Pippa and our doctor and Rebecca. Thank you so much for being here. Give your animals a hug from all of us here at Family Matters. Thanks for watching. See you next time.